Hey guys, Crypto Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. And last time we connected the camera, the QHY268M with the filter wheel with my uh, 36 millimeters filter LRGBHSO. And we added the adapters on top and we connected that to my beautiful little uh, Sharpstar 61 EDPH2 uh, triplet telescope and it looks all sexy and gorgeous. So in this video, I want to show you how it looks like overall, what is connected where and how. And uh, since the weather is actually not going to be good tonight or any of the following nights for a while, I'll be taking some flat frames and some dark frames, and especially we'll be looking at the dark frames to see you know, how they actually look like. There's a little tiny bit of wind here. <laughs> so yeah, uh, sorry. Wow, sorry if the microphone has trouble uh, picking up my voice in the wind. It should be more or less protected from the wind, but this is really extreme. Um, anyway, uh, this is how everything is connected. So we first have the camera, which is connected via the USB 3 cable provided by QHY to a little computer that's here. So this is the connection. We also have the filter wheel, which as I showed last time, it seems to have a specific cable that connects the camera to the filter wheel. Now, whether it's going to work with uh, Nina or not, uh, it remains to be seen. If it doesn't work, there is also a USB cable that you can a uh, USB plug where you can put a normal USB uh, two cable and then I can just connect it to the computer uh, so these are the two main connections obviously we have a power uh, connection and this is a power cable that has been provided by QHY as part of the package that goes to my 12 volt 6 amp amps uh, adapter which is actually not the one provided by QHY but it's the one that I've been using for a while if I have trouble I'll be using the one provided by QHY uh, then we have the uh, guider, which is also a QHY camera, QHY 5L2M, uh, which is a monochrome camera. It's quite old, uh, but it works decently enough, and I have it connected via USB 2 to uh, my computer here. Uh, we also have the ZW electronic uh, focuser, the EAF, connected by USB 2 with also a 12 volt power uh, input. And uh, yes, we have obviously the main computer here and we also have another uh, cable that is connected to the actual mount for uh, mount control. So this is how everything is like tied together. So we have everything like this on a fairly small uh, package with the Sharpstar 61 ADPH, the focal reducer that makes it f4.5, the 55 millimeters of distance to the camera sensor using the QHY adapters, which are not threaded adapters. They are adapters that you screw in, which has advantages. Like you cannot like uh, basically block those adapters together or make it so that they're difficult to remove afterwards. It's also like bringing me some questions, like how do I add a one millimeter spacer, for instance? Um, it's 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 a, a great idea and. I think, I mean, it's very neat, very tidy, and very um, well uh, attached together, which is really nice. Uh, I just want to see how it's going to work in the long term for me. So we'll see that. Um, and we have the uh, EQ6R mount uh, here. We'll be pairing there that with LRGB filters from Optolong that I bought it an, an eternity ago and a three nanometer um, H-alpha S2 and O3 filters from Astrodon. Uh, so for Narman images. Uh, and the first thing that we'll do tonight is dark frames and flat frames. And by then I'll also be installing the drivers for the QHY cameras. Um, and actually like I'm actually on the driver installation screen right now from a computer downstairs remotely connected to here. It tells me that I should unplug my QHY cameras to start with. So there they are, they are unplugged. And I am going to try to uh, install of all of this. Hopefully, it's gonna work. Uh, it seems that since this camera is so recent, we have to use the beta version of the drivers. Fingers crossed, if I have issues, I'll just be asking QHY for, uh, for some help and letting you know how it went. So uh, with that, uh, I'll be installing all of that stuff. I'll let you know if there's anything weird going on. And uh, I'll see you probably tonight for some flat frames and for some dark frames. Uh, and for you, it's gonna be immediately 
through the magic of editing. So see you then. Okay, and here I am. I have installed the QHY drivers on this uh, little computer. And the installation process was actually very simple. It's just downloading the all-in-one installer and uh, just running it. It will ask you at one point whether you want to install the drivers for third-party apps like Nina, which I said yes, and also SharpCap. So we just like uh, check those boxes. And otherwise, it's next, next, next. Uh, make sure to follow the instructions, meaning that before you install the drivers, you want to disconnect the cameras from the PC. And it, at the end, it asked me to restart my PC, which I did. And once this is done, we actually have access to the camera and the filter wheel within Nina. So if I look at my Nina screen right now, you can see I am connected to the uh, QHY268M. This is using the native driver. This is not ASCOM. And the bonus is that I am also connected to the filter wheel, which is connected via this proprietary QHY connector rather than directly via USB. So this is not an ASCOM driver for the filter wheel it's also a native driver that has been implemented by the nina developers and that is awesome and the nina devs are awesome so just just saying I, it's really amazing the amount of work that went in there which means that you know um in with a zw camera i could use the usb hub at the back of the camera to just connect to my filter wheel via uh, usb which works and then i can use either the uh, ascom driver in nina or the native driver in Nina, because there's also a native driver for ZW uh, filter wheels. And by the way, that native driver seems to fix the issue that I had with my ZW filter wheel. I'm not completely sure yet, but maybe it's the solution. At any rate, kudos to the uh, Nina uh, developers. I want to talk about a bit about the options for the camera that I'll be using, especially the gain, the offset, and most importantly, the readout mode. And that's when, that's the thing with the, um, the 268M, you can see that if I look at the gain and dynamic range charts in there, instead of having a single curve that tells you what's my like read noise versus the gain, or what's my dynamic range versus the gain, I have four curves. And that's because the camera has at this stage, it could be updated via software, four readout modes. It's almost like it's four different cameras. Um, and each readout mode has its advantages and drawbacks. And if you look at uh, the one here that provides the highest dynamic range, this is readout mode number one. It starts at number zero. So it's the second readout mode, e.g. readout mode number one. And you can see that around a gain of 60, you get better dynamic range. And this is because at around a gain of 60, you get less read noise. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you may want to watch my video on this topic if I'm not too lazy i'll be linking to it above or above i don't know somewhere um so yeah feel free to uh to watch that but basically this number 60 is actually not the correct value it's apparently 56 if you want to be uh precise and so i'll be using and that's following advice from uh nina devs but also stuff that i saw on cloudy nights a gain of 56 and an offset of 25 with that camera on the readout number one, which is the second readout. And just for information in Nina, if you're using Nina, uh, the readout modes are not numbered, uh, but they're in the same order as what QHY has on their website. So readout mode zero from QHY is this photographic DSO. One is high gain mode, two is extend full well, and three is extend full well to CMS, whatever that means. I'm not an expert. <laughs> Uh, so I uh, will be using the high gain mode and this is what we're going to be using tonight and it seems that my temp target temperature of minus 10 degrees has been reached and the cooler is kind of like dialing back, back down to around 85 percent so things seem to be working fine as it is the drivers are installed I am connected in Nina and I could uh, f just go to the imaging tab maybe try to take one exposure see if we get something and if we do get something i think we can safely assume that it is working so exposing one second and yes we do get something excellent so tonight we'll be able to take some flat frames and i'll be taking some uh, dark frames and we'll be looking at especially those dark frames see how they look like see if they're really and glow free uh, to see how well we can uh, we can work with those. So here I am after the night. I didn't capture any um, footage 
during the night. Uh, but I did take some flat frames and uh, some dark frames. And let's have a look at the computer to see uh, a dark frame. So I've, I've opened this dark frame in PixInsight. It's taken at minus 10 degrees on the camera. Um, the outside temperature was around 14, 15 degrees and the camera had to be at around 60% of cooler power to maintain minus 10 degrees, which bodes well for the cooling capabilities of the camera. That being said, the way that the QHY cameras perform the cooling compared to ZW is completely alien to me. Um, ZW, they do like progressive cooling. So you see the power slowly going up, then re reaching a, a plateau when it's near the, uh, or at the target temperature. And then it will, it will get lowered a little bit to keep maintaining that temperature and not go below it. And QHY seems to pump up the whole power and um, Nina th seems to be like kind of confused about that and tells me that I will not be able to reach the temperature necessary or the, the target temperature, but it's not the case. Full power is applied until the temperature, then it's like slowly dropped down, like reapplied. It's kind of weird. I'm not sure exactly what the, uh, the QHY cooling, cooling algorithm is, but I can say it works which is uh, good enough for me. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering about how well it will work in Nina if you're using the uh, sequence option in 1.11, which is to uh, cool the camera upon startup. Like how will Nina react when it thinks that uh, the target temperature will not be able to be reached? So that's something, but uh, maybe it's just me not using it uh, correctly and it does work so everything's fine anyway let's have a look at a dark frame the 90 second minus 10 degree star uh, dark frame i will explain why 90 seconds uh, in a moment so we can look at a dark frame and uh, obviously without stretch stretching it's a dark frame uh, with stretching here it is it yeah it's a it's a perfect dark frame it does not have any uh, amp glow at all. So uh, there is, I, I kind of feel like there is a bias kind of horizontal line banding signal there, which is fine because you know, uh, my, my dark frames will, uh, will capture that. And there again, there is no amp glow. This is a very, very clean dark frame. And that is really, really nice. Um, with like, yeah, beautiful. So it, it reminds me of the uh, ASI 533 MC Pro whose sensor in a, in a way is a color version of a little brother to this particular uh, QHY268M uh, sensor, but it's just, it's so clean. And I do think that it means that optimizing dark frames in PixInsight will become possible. And uh, optimizing dark frames is basically taking a 90 second dark frame and just scaling it to simulate a 300 dark frame, 300 seconds dark frame, for instance. And if you have M-Glow, that doesn't work at all, but without M-Glow, it might actually work. So that's something uh, very, very interesting. And yesterday, um, and this is the reason why I took 90 seconds dark frames, there were actually some clear skies. There was a lot of wind, but I had forgotten after using my Newt for so long, how easy it is to image with a small refractor like my Sharpstar 6180DPH2 even when there is a lot of wind on at least on an EQ6R mount it's like the mount doesn't care um, and so it was uh, I look at that, looked at that and I just like pointed kind of like 60 degrees up I used the uh, the Nina exposure calculation optimal exposure time calculator um, to check Nina told me like 61 seconds is optimal exposure with an H alpha three nanometer band path, band pass filter, which surprised me quite a bit. Uh, so I said like, okay, let's add 50% to that uh, 90 seconds and uh, let's point this at Orion and at the cone nebula. And <laughs> yeah, I hadn't expected to, um, to do any real world testing of the camera last night. And I feel like a, a child uh, caught with his hand in the cookie jar because I absolutely did. So let's have a look at a single 90 second frame of Orion of M42. So this is a single frame. Orion was still, was already very low on uh, the horizon. So really within the, the, 
the, the cloud of light pollution that exudes from Tokyo. <laughs> Yummy. Uh, and let's look at this first. <laughs> the field of view. It's not full frame sensor, but APS-C sensor. <laughs> that field of view is, uh, is pretty amazing. Like Orion is like this little tiny thing in the middle. Whereas like if I were to use my 533 MC Pro, Orion would be like the only thing that I see. And I have like Running Man, Orion, and that's it. And here I have like ah, the whole space around it, which is great when you're doing narrowband. Uh, because there's so much nebulosity around Orion to, uh, to capture. And um, this is a calibrated uh, single exposure, by the way. So I've applied flats and I've applied uh, darks. So uh, yeah, and the, the dark itself looked like that. This is not the master dark, by the way, it's a single dark. Um, and it looks so freaking clean, right? I mean, yeah. And obviously Orion itself in the single frame. I mean, I'm not so surprised about how well, uh, you know, Orion has been captured in a single frame because it is a very bright object. But what I will be impressed by is how much details we can recover from the core uh, because I'm used to overexposing the core of Orion to get the nebula nebulosity around, uh, around the target. And uh, 90 seconds, uh, even in, in narrowband H alpha, I'm used to the core just being completely blown out and not recoverable. And uh, we'll have a look at that in a moment <laughs> because we do have quite a, a good bit of uh, dynamic range. Uh, before that, if we look at this uh, single frame and I look at the uh, corners, um, the sensor is not too badly tilted. There might be a little bit of tilt that affects the top left corner Top right corner, uh, bottom left is also affected. We can see the, the stars are a bit uh, elongated. So it seems to be more or less in that direction. We can see here, and actually it doesn't look like center shift uh, since we have like the elongation angle is kind of like this. Uh, it looks like it's distance to the, uh, to the sensor. But then when I look here, it looks more like sensor shift. So I probably have some sensor shift and uh, some wrong distance from the sensor. And as expected, I need to uh, get one more millimeter roughly between the telescope and the camera sensor. And with the way that QHY does things, I'm not quite sure how to do it. So maybe just like an M48 um, plastic ring or spacer ring that I can sandwich in between the layers of the QHY kind of adapters that we looked at in the previous video might work, but then there are the, the adapters have grooves, right? To avoid light leakage. And those grooves might no longer align properly. And maybe the tilt is actually due to those adapters because there's at least one place where the groove is not perfectly, um, like the one millimeter thick adapter apparently is not quite perfectly smooth against the others. So that might have introduced tilt. But anyway, this is single exposure on Orion 90 seconds. Now let's look at a stacked 30 minutes, a bit less total 30 minutes of Orion. So 19 frames of 90 seconds each. No dithering because I used the snapshot feature in Nina rather than the sequence. I just did it without uh, anything, any uh, particular um, work and no dithering, nothing. And this is how it looks like. And there is no dithering again like dither or die or maybe you, maybe you don't have to dither <laughs> with, a, with a sensor that as, that's as clean as this. Oh my word, this is amazing. So this is a stacked image and this is less than 30 minutes in Tokyo. Still, it's in narrowband H alpha. So this strong signal and a, a very big, good filtering of the light pollution, but still Orion was very low on the horizon. And I'm really amazed at being able to get such a result. And what we're going to quickly do is, um, yeah, dynamic background extraction. I'll just put a few points here and there so that there's this like bottom left, upper right gradient that we're uh, seeing that I just want to quickly uh, get rid of. And here we are. So now we see that we have the main nebula, but also a lot of the nebulosity around. And this is without dithering. Oh my word, this is amazing. 
Uh, yeah, so <laughs> sorry, I'm, 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 I'm kind of geeking out on the result. Now let's, uh, let's keep going. We are going to quickly do um, easy processing suite. I won't bother with denoise. I'll just do a soft stretch because I really like the way that the soft stretch works on, um, yeah, so that looks like it's the one. Yes, uh, we're gonna do now, and this is where the fun really is, uh, HDR multi-scale multi uh, transform, transform. So I'll go into uh, there, I'll do a two lightness with lightness ma mask, apply it, and this is where the dynamic range really comes into play. Um, oh my word, look at this. Sorry, I'm, I'm so geeking out here. Look at this, we have the trapezium. All the four stars of the trapezium are visible. Everything is visible, everything is there. We have not blown out the core of the nebula. Everything is visible. I didn't have to do any specific manipulations. <sighs> <laughs> I don't think I'd be, I'd, I'd be I, I'm, I'm actually pretty sure I wasn't able to do that with the 1600 uh, mm uh, cool that I have. This is really, this is, yeah, yeah, heck yeah. This is really, really nice. This is what having um, a big full, full depth, uh, full well depth and a low um, read noise uh, really gets you. I mean, this is quite a result. Um, let's, oh my word, look at this, all of that nebulosity around, around Orion there. Oh man, oh man. I, I've blown it out again, but look at this. So much is possible there. Oh. So this is a very, very good first light uh, with just 30 minutes from Tokyo. I did spend one hour as well on the, um, the cone nebula slash uh, Christmas tree uh, nebula. And uh, again, like this is a, a subject that was also quite low on the horizon already, although a bit higher than uh, Orion. Uh, this is one hour of data, exactly one hour of data of 90 second exposures. This time there is dithering every two frames, uh, but I'm not even sure whether I even need to dither with this sensor. It's, uh, it's just amazing. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna do a quick, uh, easy soft stretch there it is, it's a bit darker. Then we can do some, some curves. Oh man, yes. Yes, this is nice. So we do have captured quite a bit of, of nebulosity there. And uh, it's such a clean image for just one hour of, uh, of data in Tokyo. Yes, in, in three nanometers narrow band, but still in Tokyo, like this is so clean. Noise reduction will work amazingly on this. So I can't wait to like really do a proper um, SHO full narrowband project on this because this looks amazing. I, I am very impressed by, uh, by this sensor and I'm actually very happy to see that the QHY setup worked immediately on the first night. I didn't have to fiddle too much. Obviously you saw me a bit struggle with the installation of the camera because this was completely new to me and um, connection to the telescope. Uh, but then like the drivers work well, Nina worked well, uh, the settings worked well, everything worked together and it was uh, overall a pretty painless experience. So now I need to take more images with uh, this camera to really do a proper review. But this has been really my journey of discovery of the QHY world via the QHY 6268M camera, which, oh my God, my first impression are, yeah, my first impressions are very positive. <laughs> I want it. Maybe I should tell QHY I'm buying it. Uh, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah, it's good. <laughs> oh man, I hope I'm not, I, I have to resist that impulse. Uh, but yeah, we're getting, uh, we're getting good initial results. Um, I'll try to work on the tilt, except that you know me, I don't really care about star shapes. So maybe I won't work on the tilt. This is good enough and uh, I will be having fun when it's good weather in the, the next few weeks, hopefully. Uh, although we are slowly but surely entering into the rainy season. Uh, so with that, 
Thank you so much for watching. This is again, I think a long video, but uh, yes, thanks for watching. It's really a journey of discovery for me. That's why I go into all of those details and I hope it's worth it and I wasn't wasting your time. So thanks again. Um, you know, be sure to subscribe to make sure that you catch my next videos on this camera and on astrophotography in general. Click like down below or dislike if you dislike the video or you're Australian. And um, otherwise, yeah. Remember to leave a comment if you wish to and to always uh, look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.